Okay. Uh, welcome to the side event that we look at the uh, using citizen science effectively within the OVIS context. Um, this, um, I'm Muki Hakla. I'm a professor at University College London. And uh, I'm also a member and a previous board member of the European Citizen Science Association, uh, which is organizing this event. The purpose of the side event is to introduce citizen science within our context, and we will kind of understand a bit what citizen science is. Um, and it can be generally understood within this context as the co-production of environmental information or having new people and new groups joining in the process of creating the information. And we will give a lot of examples during the event on linkage to different international efforts, such as the Sustainable Development Goal, the UN Environment Assembly, UNESCO guidelines on open science, and uh, we'll also understand the role of coordinating organizations. So, to start with, we can actually go back to the uh, same process that led to the uh, Aarhus Convention, the uh, Rio Conference of 1992 and Agenda 21. And in the chapter about information for decision-making, the first paragraph is actually pointing out that in sustainable development, everyone is a user and provider of information considered in the broad sense. And for a very long time, uh, the only bit of it that was there and also integrated into processes like ours was user of information. But actually uh, we can see that, that there was an element of also producing information that was done by many people around the globe. An example of that uh, existed over the years. For example, in the UK, even in 1835, uh, William Hewell created a great tide experiment where thousands of volunteers around the world uh, carried out measurements of tides every 15 minutes, and that created support for naval uh, maps that were used by the government or in the mid uh, 1800s, 1850s, uh, the Smithsonian Institute created the weather volunteers and setting up national planning and weather system. And that is true also across Europe and many other places. In the 1950s, Operation Moonwatch was a process where uh, volunteers were setting up uh, observation groups to monitor the movement in the direction of human-made satellites. And that was very helpful to government within the context of Cold War monitoring. Or in 1966, the US Breeding Bird Survey, it was uh, done following Silent Spring and other environmental interests, but it contributed because it's such a long-term data to things like climate change, IPPC report, and other national plan. So actually we can see that this engagement of the public of different people who are not scientists within provision of environmental information to government have a very long history. So what we're going to do in our session today, we'll have a set of very short presentation like we just have now of five minutes I will introduce to citizen science uh, within environmental data collection and help you to understand what we mean by citizen science. Next, uh, Sven Schkader from the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center will talk about the integration of uh, citizen science in environmental policy. Next, uh, Dilek Fraser from uh, YASA 
will uh, help us to understand the uh, way that citizen science can help in the SDG. Francois Gray from the University of Geneva will then show in a practical way how providing trained skills and tools for citizen science within the SDG. Then we have Martin Bockelhurst from the European Citizen Science Association, which will guide us through the development in UNEA and uh, different international collaborations. We then follow that by uh, Professor Uta Ven, uh, who will talk with us about the integration uh, of citizen science within the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which have relevance to the issues that we discuss uh, within the Aarhus context. Uh, and then Barbara Kisslinger will uh, talk with the example of EXA itself about how coordination is happening. And finally, we have uh, Anna Berti Schumann, who will also is currently at the uh, GRC and the George Research Center, uh, which will cover directly in the context of Aarhus the issue of, uh, of procedural and, and substantive right recognized and the use of citizen science within that. We have plenty of time for discussion and questions. If you have any, you can, as we go through the presentations, you can already put them in the chat and then we will address them at the end of the uh, presentation. So I'll start with my own presentation to give you a really short introduction to what we mean by citizen science. So citizen science is defined generally as the participation of the public in, a, in scientific project. It sometimes can take the form of people participating in all the stages of the process from setting up the research question to deciding what to collect and uh, then analyzing the data. But much more commonly, it is a project that uh, the public is helping scientists and uh, government scientists in a specific task. A good example of that is a very well established network in the US called the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network or COCORAS for short, where people are, give, are being given rain gauges and then they report on it every day and that helps meteorological observation. But more importantly, those volunteers are now used to report information. And when there is an extreme weather event, they can report on it with specific tools, which help in uh, giving an early warning about floods and other extreme events. Another one is um, the projects that actually require participants to provide some resource. For example, allowing a scientist to use their computers when they are not using them. Good example that was led by the uh, University of Geneva and Francois Gray was involved in that, uh, was to use uh, those extra resources to, computing, to compute the use of nanotubes for filtering water. And that's a form of citizen science that allow a lot of people to participate, but in a, a, through a very limited investment of time from their side, but it can lead to very helpful results to the scientists. At another end of the spectrum, we have projects where people are involved in the data collection itself and deciding where to collect the data. So two good examples are a project that was done in the early 2010s around using mobile phone as a noise meters and allowing people to collect different information or the recent project, Odor Collect, we, where people are uh, recording no, uh, smell pollution because it's still something that humans are doing much better than our ability to use sensors for it. And there are good ways of collecting and sharing the data on these things. 
So we see here a whole range of ways in which people can participate in collecting environmental information. They are concerned about citizen science that you'll hear quite frequently. Um, for example, that uh, one about data quality uh, that asks if can untrained participants carry out data collection properly, which is something that, that sometimes happen. Especially in the environmental area, there will, can be concern about activism and an assumption that if someone is an activist, they can't collect data properly, although the scientific rigor is as important for the activist as for scientists. And as long as we have a very rigorous way of testing the quality of the data, that can, can work. And also there is the issue of institutional acceptance and also resistance to adopting those techniques because uh, having other people involved in the process sometimes create internal issues for organizations. And there are solutions for this problem. So for example, a very good solution that exists in the UK for over 50 years is the biological record centers where uh, what you do is you have expert in the loop. Actually, that's a group of scientists funded by the government through the Natural, uh, Natural Environment Research Council who basically work as the gateway in which they support a whole range of volunteers who collect data and do their different biological observations or ecological observations. And uh, what they do is provide also the quality assurance, the knowledge that the data is of high quality and helping to use it properly within decision-making processes. So that's one way of dealing with the obstacle. Another way of dealing with that is to learn from organizations that already have done that. So a good example of that is the US Geological Survey, which have a history of using citizen science in different ways. For example, asking people to report when there is a, an earthquake or to contribute to the mapping of the US. And once you see that, you see that the organization is continuing developing new method because there is the know-how. And that's something that, that actually we offering within this event and beyond that, that those networks that exist now of organizations and individuals that are familiar with these techniques and know how to share the knowledge about it can help you in integrating it in different processes. So that's a short introduction to citizen science within our context. And now let me pass over to Sven, who will tell us about a study that the JRC has done around the uh, integration of citizen science in environmental policy. Over to you, Sven. Thank you very much, Muki, and welcome also uh, from my side. Uh, I'm Sven Schade, and I'm working for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And our main mandate is actually to, uh, to create and to deliver uh, scientific evidence to policymaking. And in this context, we also take action to interconnect citizen science and policymaking, monitoring and implementation. Uh, so this is basically the lens I will provide now to this uh, session. And what you see on the next slide uh, is the way how we are sketching the interplay between citizen science and policy. So this, uh, what you see here is based of our work of the last five to six years, where uh, we are really working on the interconnection of activities as Muki just uh, sketched, where data is gathered, where data is validated and quality controlled and analyzed, uh, analyzed by citizen scientists and with citizen scientists. And what we are pretty much looking for is to connect this information to existing uh, policymaking processes, to then, of course, also take informed decision based on this uh, knowledge, including citizen science contributions. And after decisions have been taken, to monitor the impact of the political decisions, which then again uh, lead us to data gathering. So you really see that this is a cyclic value chain of integrating citizen science uh, in policy. And you can imagine to go through this process, 
uh, using a whole lot of different uh, semantic areas. So you could think about bird monitoring, biodiversity monitoring in general, uh, but also in a lot of cases related to environmental pollution. So what you see on the next slide, a few years ago, uh, we were actually looking into um, which kind of citizen science activities currently exist primarily in Europe to support environmental policy. So there was actually a big work going on uh, with, um, with Anne Terp, um, Lucy Robinson, uh, Fermin uh, Serrano Sanz, and a few others to really investigate which kind of projects are out there. Uh, and this basically was an activity carried out in 2018. And we were looking into more than 500 different projects. Um, and whereas this, this is published in a scientific article and, and the report more technically, you just here have a very rough sketch that uh, about 80% of the projects we found were related to biodiversity, nature and landscape. But we also had a good portion of the projects dealing with, with air quality, with water quality, with climate and change of climate, uh, land, for example, land cover, waste and a lot of other topics. So you really see that there are solid approaches out there to integrate citizen science and the data they produced to environmental policy. So we see many, many good cases out there um, already existing, sometimes uh, as, as, as islands in, in a, wilder, a wider, wider setting. As you see on my third slide, um, we also see in addition to these sometimes island solutions, let's say, uh, that more and more of these uh, activities are supported more integratively uh, by policies, especially again, uh, building on the European context, uh, what you see here is that there is policy on nature, people and the economy, policy to streamline environmental uh, reporting and compliance assurance, and are also very specific policies on, on pollinators and other areas of biodiversity that explicitly provide a legal setting and the framing to integrate data from citizen science into environmental monitoring. As a highlight, what I put on the left on this slide is a, a, a document that we published as a European Commission after very intense consultation to really provide best practices to connect citizen science and environmental monitoring. So this document captures uh, the challenges, raises a few best practices but it also gives recommendations and possible actions how we could be more systemic and support more integration of the valuable data coming from citizen, from citizen science to policy making. And to close with um, what you see on the bottom page, it's a, it's a scientific article not written by, by the commission, but by representatives of uh, environmental protection agencies all over Europe. Uh, and here, basically, in this paper, they are also explaining how these agencies uh, embrace these higher level policies and also implement um, data flows where citizen science is integrated into their daily business. I stop here. I hope I could get you an overview on, on citizen science and environmental policy. Uh, of course, I'm available for more questions uh, by chat or later on. But with this, uh, I stop and pass on to Dilek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. And our third speaker, uh, Dilek. Thank you, Muti, uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dilek Freisel, and I work at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Uh, it's an international research institute based in Austria. And today, I will talk about the potential of citizen science as a source of data and a way to mobilize action uh, to address some of the challenges that uh, we're facing today. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you see the results of a scientific paper we published exactly on this topic last year. But let me talk a little bit about the SDG framework first. So I guess you're all familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs, but very briefly, they represent a universal agenda to address the world's most pressing challenges. And to implement the SDGs successfully, what we need is actually timely, relevant, and reliable data that could guide policies and decisions. And, but if you look at the current landscape right now, 
the official statistics using mainly traditional sources of data, such as household surveys, to monitor progress on development cannot provide all of the data needed to populate the SDG indicator framework, which is very broad, covering issues from hunger to climate change. And as a result of this is, for instance, 58% of the environmental SDG indicators lack data, according to UNEP. So with this research, we wanted to show how citizen science data could address some of these challenges. And in this figure, you see the existing and potential contributions of citizen science data to SDG monitoring. I won't go into details, but very briefly, um, an interesting result of this uh, research is, even though there is lots of potential for citizen science data to contribute to SDG monitoring officially, and these are the yellow boxes you see here, this potential is actually only realized for a few indicators only at this point. And these are the green ones. So it is actually safe to say that the potential offered uh, by citizen science data is far from being realized for SDG monitoring. And our findings also show that citizen science data are already contributing and could potentially contribute to 33% of the SDG indicators. And uh, it is also important to highlight that citizen science data have the greatest potential for input to the environmental SDG indicators, which I mentioned before, 58% of which currently lack data. Next slide, please. So in terms of the goals where this potential lies, um, the greatest contribution from citizen science to SDG indicators would be in SDG 15, life on land, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, SDG 3, health, and SDG 6, water. Next slide, please. So actually there is one very concrete example that I would like to highlight today as Muki asked me to uh, provide an example on how these contributions could happen. Um, so I, I, I like this example a, a lot because it's not only a theory, it shows actually this whole framework that I was presenting to you today is not a theory only, but instead it's an applicable framework as long as there's will to cooperate and support and trust. So this project is uh, called Citizen Science for the SDGs project led by IASA and in collaboration with the Ghana Statistical Service and Ghana EPA, as well as UNEP and many others. And this is about leveraging marine leader citizen science data for the official monitoring and reporting of the SDG indicator 14.1.1b on marine litter. So we recently finalized the project. And with this initiative, Ghana became the first country that reported on marine litter officially. And the first time Ghana used citizen science data to contribute to reporting of a national statistics, which is quite progressive. And additionally, the Ghana EPA indicated that the data and results to be integrated into Ghana's oceans plan which is uh, currently under development, which means embedding this data in a national strategy in a sustainable way. And our most important learning in this project was building trust, common goals and ownership is the key to make this vision of integrating citizen science into official statistics a reality. So now we're in the process of producing um, a scientific paper and a step-by-step -step guideline to support other national statistical offices worldwide on how to work with citizen science data to leverage its potential for this indicator particularly, but also other indicators potentially. So this is a concrete implementation of this research results and hopefully we'll set the examples for other countries and other fields in various fields where there is a need for timely data. Next slide, please. So finally, what is the progress we made for the integration of citizen science into the SDG framework, apart from the example that I highlighted today? So this is a figure we created in 2019, two years ago for a paper published in Nature Sustainability with support from the global citizen science community and many people uh, that are here already contributed to this piece. It describes concrete steps that should be taken to realize the potential offered by citizen science for monitoring the SDGs. And if you look at both global and national levels here, you see that most of these steps are successfully carried out um, based on the example, for instance, I provided now. And citizen science has never become such a high level discussion topic at the UN 
or um, through the National Statistical Office for SDG monitoring. And the Global Citizen Science Partnership being in the process of uh, incorporation, I believe citizen science will establish itself very soon, not only as a way to close data gaps in development, but also a way to increase knowledge, action, and to achieve sustainable development in general. So I'll stop here and happy to answer any question during this session. Thank you, Muki. Over to you. Thank you, Dilek. And now uh, we'll hear from Francois about the experience of actually turning the ideas that Dilek presented into active project and increasing the training and skills. Yeah, thank you, Muki. And uh, I'll be presenting with my colleague, Rosie Mondardini from Citizen Science Center Zurich. Uh, so if you can have the first slide. Um, I'm here in uh, Geneva at uh, something called Citizen Cyber Lab, which is a collaboration between the University of Geneva, the UN Institute for Training and Research, and CERN, the particle physics uh, lab here. Uh, we've been working on citizen science for a decade, and uh, in 2015, with the arrival of the SDGs, we focused on how citizen science can uh, contribute to the SDGs. And we're currently running a European project called Crowd for SDG, uh, together with um, uh, researchers in Milan, Barcelona, and Paris, uh, looking at ways to um, uh, combine various technologies to accelerate uh, uh, citizen science for the SDGs. Uh, but in particular, looking at how we can encourage young people to start um, SDG-related citizen science projects themselves uh, with easy-to-use. Uh, tools, often digital tools. So the Crowd for SDG project is a uh, is an it starts with uh, something called the Open Seventeen Challenge, uh, where we invite uh, young people on a on a public platform, not Facebook or Twitter, but uh, a European platform for youth called Goodwall, um, basically TikTok for the SDGs, and the young people come up with ideas, and then we coach them through a process of creating their own uh, citizen science projects uh, around that, that idea. Uh, so crowd for sdg is uh, halfway through a, a three-year process. And with UNITAR, we're working very much on connecting this sort of bottom-up citizen science with the needs of the national statistical offices around the world, uh, which are, in the end, the organizations that need this sort of data. Uh, so we've been having a lot of workshops with the NSOs about that. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so we're here in Geneva, and uh, you know it's a shame uh, that because of COVID, very few of you will be able to travel to the conference, perhaps. But uh, if you do make it here, you're very welcome to our SDG solution space right in the heart of international Geneva. It's a makerspace and fab lab uh, where we have uh, student programs uh, for the SDGs. In fact, uh, a comprehensive education program around the SDGs. Uh, what you see here, for example, are master students uh, working on projects, and they all have to do a one semester internship uh, in international Geneva with, uh, with many of the organizations here. And uh, just across the street, literally, we have the, the World Meteorological Organization, the World Trade Organization, International Telecommunications Union, and uh, up the street, the UNECE, which, uh, which launched uh, the Oros uh, Convention. Uh, and we're very uh, much into getting our students basically to, um, to be embedded in these institutions and introduce uh, citizen science uh, methodologies uh, to our colleagues in the international organizations. Uh, and some of the tools we teach them about are developed by our colleagues uh, in Zurich at the Citizen Science Center Zurich. So I pass to Rosie. Yes, uh, thank you, Francois. If uh, I can have the next slide. I am uh, Rosie Mondardini, and I am the Managing Director of the Citizen Science Center in Zurich, which is an initiative of the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. And uh, the center is also a third party of the crowd for SDG uh, project that Francois just mentioned. So what we did in Zurich, we decided to um, focus a major part of our activity into developing an infrastructure that can help uh, all practitioners to um, set up citizen science projects. And these can be researchers, but can be students, can be young innovation, innovators. 
the one that Francois just mentioned that are called from all over the world to come up with ideas for project, uh, can be citizens really from everywhere. Um, and why we're doing this? Because we noticed that when people um, start approaching the methodology, one of the first obstacles that they encounter is often that they need some sort of tools. Uh, you have heard the different examples, and usually these projects involve uh, collecting data, collecting images or video or audio, or maybe looking at existing images via a web interface. And building this kind of infrastructure can be really resource intense. So we did it, we developed a set of open tools which are available for everywhere, for everybody. And in particular, two tools, one is uh, the Citizen Science Project Builder that allows if you have existing digital data, can be video, audio, images, images from satellites, uh, it allows you to create an interface that uh, basically uh, where people can join and help you in any kind of classification or tagging. And the other one is the citizen science logger that uh, allows you to create uh, um, a smartphone app for the collection of data. So the collection of images, again, video, audio, in case you don't have those. And both the tools work with the same principle, the same idea. There is a web interface, you log in, you create your interface. Again, it can be web for data analysis, can be smartphone for data collection. You design your questionnaire. And then with just one click, uh, you publish it. Uh, the app goes into, is for Android and Apple. The project builder is on the web. And here you go. You can start your project, uh, call your crowd, call, maybe start with your friends and colleagues to test, uh, modify, improve, uh, and run your project. Any further information, feel free to go to citizenscience.ch where you will find more details. Thank you very much. And uh, we're, we'll follow up in the Q&A if there's any questions. Over to you, Muki. Thank you very much. Um, and now continuing in the different potential for international activities, uh, Martin will talk with us about you now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if I could start by saying that we could not have known when we launched the Europe I'll leave the first slide on if we could, Muki. Sorry. Um, we could not have known when we launched the European Citizen Science Association in 2013 how severe the global environmental crises would become due to failure to deliver on global multilateral agreements. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution of our air, water, and seas are the challenges of our time. What our politicians have shown us is that none of these challenges can be solved without the rapid involvement of the citizens who inhabit this earth. At the launch of EXA understood the potential power of citizen science to mobilize people to do just that. The first was Janis Potocnik, then the Environment Commissioner at the EU. He opened doors into the EU for the newly formed European Citizen Science Association. And you have heard how that interaction has blossomed and how the EU has become a leader and champion of citizen science. If we could have the next slide, please. The other person was Professor Jacqueline McGlade, the soon to be chief scientist at the United Nations Environment Programme. She saw the power of citizen scientists to come together, agree common methods and systems to tackle global problems. She helped the emerging citizen science movement to illustrate how this could be done, to track and understand the risks of mosquito expansion and potential transmission of Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever, Chikungaya, and Malaria at a density, accuracy, and cost not possible in any other way. Global Mosquito Alert was born out of this work. If we could have the next slide, please. This experience demonstrated the need for global coordination and for a voice to argue the case for citizen science at the United Nations Environment Assembly. And the slide you have here tracks some of the uh, important dates and milestones as we worked our way from 2015 through to the current date in, in making sure that citizen science was more effectively integrated into the international processes. 
we've worked consistently through the United Nations Science Policy Business Forum uh, with the encouragement of Sharina Zorba and Alexander Kaldas at the United Nations Environment Programme. The Citizen Science Global Partnership itself was formed as a loose association in 2017, just three years after the formation of the European, Australian and American Citizen Science Associations. That same year, the Citizen Science Global Partnership encouraged and supported the formation of African and Asian associations. And with the emergence of RECAP for South and Central America has encouraged citizen science groups across the planet. If you could have the next slide, please. Since 2017, the Citizen Science Global Partnership has worked to get citizen science recognized by UNEA as an effective way to support the development and delivery of the UN SDGs and UNEA multilateral agreements. This was finally achieved in 2019 at UNEA 4 when the ministerial declaration recognized for the first time the role of citizen science in supporting the delivery of UNEA resolutions. Since 2019, we've also seen growing recognition that to achieve its full potential, citizen science needs to be embedded in future UNEA resolutions within the work of the World Data Forum, within the Open Science Agenda of UNESCO, and within the work of the UN Science and Technology Division. Recent citizen science programs monitoring air quality in Belgium and the impact of COVID-19 in Sweden, the UK and the USA have expanded horizons to illustrate how powerful citizen science can be when operated at scale. 4.7 million people have taken part in the King's College London COVID-19 symptom tracker app, almost 1 million a day at its peak, delivering data again at a speed, density, cost and accuracy not possible in any other way, but also supporting citizens with critical information with which to manage disease risks. Next slide, please. But much more work is needed to ensure that the global potential of citizen science is delivered. The Aarhus Convention gives us a model from which we must build to take forward full integration of citizen science into UN multilateral agreements and UN programs. These are the reasons we have taken the decision, the decision to move from an informal global alliance and set up a non-government organization, the Global Citizen Science Partnership, to be based within and supported by the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. These are the reasons why the UN Science Policy Business Forum is calling for UNEA to enable citizen science across our planet and why we look forward to UNEA 5.2 in February 2022 to build a formal relationship between the newly formed Global Citizen Science Partnership and UNEP to champion citizen science at a scale across our planet. We need a new way of solving global problems together, of connecting people and working to a common cause. With modern communication tools, artificial intelligence, remote sensing and citizen science, we can drive change. Citizen science is a critical tool of our time, which we must embrace. Let me leave you with two thoughts. The UN has told us we are on code red for humanity. We have nowhere else to run, nowhere else to hide. We have one planet. My belief is that we must mobilize citizen science at global scale to solve the three great global challenges of our time. I hope I will see you join the global citizen science community to achieve that goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And now uh, our next speaker, um, Uta, will uh, take us into the realm of uh, UNESCO and open science. Thank you very much, uh, Muki. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> 
It's, it's disappeared. Yes, I'm just, I'm going to share it and I'm going to pass control. No problem at team. all. Thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon also for myself. Um, I'm affiliated not only with IG Delft and the University of Gothenburg, but a third hat I'm wearing today is that I'm co-chair of the Citizen Science and Open Science Community of Practice, which in fact is one of the initiatives that is uh, located under the Citizen Science Global Partnership that Martin Brockelhorst just introduced. A little bit more about the community of practice in a moment, but first of all, I would like to uh, speak to you more generally about uh, the, the open science movement and why that matters for our discussion on the Aarhus Convention and citizen science. And now the, yeah, there we go. So, Open science is a parallel movement, if you like, uh, to citizen science, and it means many things to many people, but quite too often it's reduced to uh, consisting of open access and open data only. Uh, but it's actually much richer and more comprehensive uh, as a movement. And in order to reach global consensus of what open science is and how we can overcome uh, fragmentation in what we might call a scientific and a policy environment, UNESCO led a process to, uh, to achieve such global consensus. Now, UNESCO is the UN agency uh, with a mandate for science, so it's, of course, uniquely positioned to lead such a process and to help create a global understanding of how we might define open science, what the opportunities are, but also what the challenges are. So UNESCO started leading this process in 2019 uh, that will result in a recommendation on open science, uh, which by now the uh, recommendation has been formulated and will be up for uh, formal adoption in November by the UNESCO uh, General Assembly. And then that's a legal instrument that can be translated and should be translated by member states into laws and national policies. So um, the relationship uh, between uh, citizen science and open science um, is actually a comprehensive one and opening up uh, access to data and publication and other research results is of course necessary but it's not sufficient to really fully transition to what we call an open scientific process, an open pro uh, production process of scientific knowledge. So citizen science is key, is key as a, as a pillar to open science, and in fact, in all steps of the scientific method. Um, it provides the means for uh, pro truly producing participatory and inclusive ways of knowledge production. And Hmm. Not allowing me to move. Mookie, maybe you need to take back control. It's not allowing me to move. Right. So given that broader uh, policy picture of open science and the, the global consensus that we're hopefully moving towards, and we heard lots of examples bottom up of how citizen science pervasively is helping to generate environmental information and knowledge. As a meso, at a meso level, I would like to uh, finish off with a view to the role of communities of practice as they have emerged within the citizen science community of practitioners to really help us to stop reinvent the wheel and to help us address a challenge that we have um, as, as citizen science, as we implement citizen science, dealing to do with uh, the awareness of citizen science, the acceptability of uh, data produced by citizen science, but also the sustainability of these initiatives. And we've seen uh, we, communities of practice dedicated to specific topics emerge, such as those that we set up under the We Observe project, where we have also managed to work and transition our ways of working in the COVID pandemic from face-to-face -face meetings to intense online collaborations. And not least, the citizen science and open science community of practice, which has helped to bring together practitioners uh, in both movements and, and help us to communicate across both movements, citizen science and open science, but not only that, to help us interface with the UNESCO policy process and now also help with the implementation of the open science recommendation at national level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me... Now take control back. Um, and our next speaker 
is Barbara, and she will tell us about the European Citizen Science Association. So over to you. Yes, hello and welcome. Thank you, Muki. I'm Barbara Kieslinger from, actually, I'm representing EXA here and as I'm one of the board of directors, as well as Martin and some other six colleagues from the citizen science community. But I'm also working at the Center for Social, uh, for Social Innovation in Vienna, Austria. And so if we go to the next slide, I think that Martin already nicely introduced a little bit of the history of some of the organizations that emerged around citizen science. And one of them is the European Citizen Science Association, which was actually launched during the EU Green Week in 2013. And then it was formally established as an association under the German law in 2014. And since then it has grown really uh, rapidly and we are now a network of over 500 practitioners and researchers and organizations uh, dealing with the um, around the topic of citizen science, which includes, as I said, academic institutions, but also NGOs, civil society organizations, natural history museums, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also individuals. So membership is also for individuals and organizations. And the vision that EXA has is really to show the value of citizens, how they can contribute to knowledge creation and innovation, and also support the uh, sustainable development. So if we go to the next slides, how or what do we do concretely in the European Citizen Science Association? So one uh, of the aspects is to show this value, we want to empower citizen scientists and doing this by, for example, um, capacity building, promoting scientific literacy and the democratization of science um, by providing uh, the European reference point, being the reference point and connecting with others. So EXA has a lot of uh, connections with the other international um, uh, citizen science associations and uh, also to policymakers and society across Europe. Uh, we connect the citizen science players within Europe. For example, within EXA, there are many working groups. For example, also just recently, a very active group was established on health issues, another one on air quality, on educational aspects, on many more. And we also have, for example, organized uh, by and uh, or every second year, uh, conference on citizen science and just there's just a teaser here the next one is going to take place in fall in Berlin where also the first one for the first conference took place and then of course we share best practices we advocate for citizen science two of the very important documents are the 10 principles of citizen science and the characteristics of citizen science and actually, if we go to the next slide there, it's just a small image of you know, how they look like. They have been already um, cited and used and reused again in many contexts, also in policy contexts, for example, where funding programs who fund uh, citizen science activities also uh, base, for example, their criteria, their evaluation criteria on these two documents. And they have been taken up by national platforms and national initiatives as well, as well as internationally. They have been, you know, there has been a lot of exchange, for example, with, with our colleagues also in other parts of the world on these aspects. And if we go to the next slide, um, I would also like to promote a little bit here the platform that we have developed in the last few years, which is EU Citizen Science which is the platform for EXA also in the future. Uh, it includes uh, a, lot, a lot of projects on citizen science, training activities, uh, MOOCs, for example. It has specific resources and guidelines on citizen science. It uh, features organizations and it is a place also for networking. So you could also find specific interest groups. Again, there is a forum where you can connect with others on certain aspects. And also the national citizen science associations will have soon the ability to being featured there on the platform as well and connect there. That's actually already giving away a little bit uh, a part of this teaser that you see here also of the launch event. So it has had various iterations, this platform, and it's gonna have its final launch on the 27th of October, which everybody can sign up to. And there will be some of the new features and uh, will be shown there 
as well as, for example, the new uh, training materials or the new MOOCs that you can access via this platform. And that's already it from my side. So I'll get back to get back to Miki. Thank you very much. And the final presentation is bringing us back full circle to talk specifically about the Aarhus context and, uh, uh, and how citizen science link uh, in it. So Anna, over to you. Yes, thank you Muki and good afternoon everyone. I am, uh, yeah, the, the difficult task of closing this rich um, array of presentations, but I'm also maybe bringing a different perspective in the sense that I'm an environmental lawyer. And so I'm taking the lawyer perspective towards citizen science. So I'm also based at the European Commission Joint Research Center. And in this very short bit, I will introduce to you why we think that citizen sensing from a legal perspective matters, especially for releasing the full potential of citizen science in litigation, in mediation, and vis-a-vis -vis countries that in fact recognize the Aarhus Convention as a benchmark. So next, please. So in the framework of the Sensing for Justice project, which is a Marie Curie uh, individual fellowship now hosted at the European Commission, we are researching the potential of actually using evidence stemming from citizen science to claim rights. So um, probably many of the projects that you saw this afternoon basically have a potential for claiming violations of, for example, legal, legal limits like air quality thresholds or noise thresholds. And so when the citizen decide to appropriate signs to claim violations of rights, they show a knowledge of their legal entitlements. So not only a knowledge of the science behind all this, but also a knowledge of the rights that they could claim based on this evidence. And so in a sense, we are seeing in a post-normal science context, an intersection between legal and scientific truths. And in the image you see, there is a citizen scientist from Basilicata who is piling up files used in a court ruling on the evidence of oil impact on his own health. And he doesn't consider himself a citizen scientist, but in a sense, he's using Harus to claim his right to access the evidence of his own ailment. Next, please. So, um, Again, within the framework of census, we are looking at cases in the practice out there that used citizen science evidence vis-a-vis -vis court. So the case that I'm illustrating here is interesting, maybe, and especially for us European, because it doesn't use ARUS being based in the US, but it's using, Amer let's say, US-based legal argumentation to demonstrate the violation of the Clean Water Act based on citizen collected evidence. And for those who already know the case, this is the Formosa famous ruling, which saw a conviction of a petrochemical power plant, the Formosa plant in Texas for violation of the Clean Water Act. And this was mostly based on citizen collected evidence, triangulated with other evidence sources. Next, please. So, our question when we move these reflections and this, let's say, uh, iconic cases to the European debate is which legal grounds could the citizen scientist in Europe use? And of course, the ARUS framework comes to our mind as an important, let's say, uh, point of reference for citizen scientists, especially those acting in this uh, context where accessing environmental information is more difficult. And we don't think only to the global south, but really also to the south of the north, like Basilicata in the image that you see. And in this context, citizens become new sources of information for their peers and go beyond the idea that the appointed institution are those delegated and responsible for monitoring. And so under the IRIS framework, we try um, to uh, really analyze the, the legal text, the text of the convention to see whether a even four pillars under the Alumnus Convention could be recognized. That is basically the right 
under certain condition to also contribute to environmental information when the official information out there is scarce or even denied. Next, please. And as my very um, final point, being a lawyer, I always know that the, the pace of legal adaptation is quite slow. So I'm wondering which kind of legal adaptations are needed, but also at times we may not need a legal adaptation because also governance software adaptation may be enough. And of course, a sort of adoption by the institution of even forms of more spontaneous reactive citizen science could be both shield the citizen scientists from adverse effect of their monitoring, but also promote citizen science vis-a-vis -vis institution. And I'm putting here the reference both to a book and a comic stories that both were, let's say, produced to make this topic more accessible for also lay audience that are not familiar with the law. So I'm going to leave some references also in the chat and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for all our speakers. And we now uh, completed the presentation and we have seen the wide range of issues that, that are touching our discussion of citizen science within the Aarhus context of accessing information and creating information, participating in decision-making and access to uh, justice in our final talk. And now we have time for questions and comments um, and you can either switch on your microphone and ask the question. If you feel more comfortable and would like to raise hand, you can do that. Um, we will welcome question on any of the topics that we have discussed. So, while people think about their questions, I wanted to start asking our panel about the consideration, you know, in, in a short way, consider how this participation in citizen science, in your view, is can change the, um, change the, oh, gosh, actually, yeah, we, we have the, the question. Okay, so I'll go with this one from uh, Maureen. Um, so Maureen, would you like to switch your microphone or you prefer me to read it? Yes, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah, uh, I send you my question. Uh, just um, I'm a researcher in water quality and um, I'm working in the system of National Academy of Sciences, but also uh, we're working in the system of um, non-governmental organization. So um, I'm very interested in um, such cooperation and I'd like to um, join if it's possible. So I'd like to understand um, how um, we can be involved in um, projects uh, um, in uh, trainings and other activities. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're lucky to have on the panel one of the world experts in citizens' observatories of water. So Uta, if you can address yeah. this question. <laughs> Right. Well, I think there are there are many ways you can you can get involved. Uh, we have uh, ongoing observatories um, that you can you can learn about how what the process is to set them up. We have produced guidance to do so. But I think I understand from your question that you would like to collaborate in projects where this is done jointly with with other parties. So I think that the, the regular process is to go for joint funding um, under Horizon Europe, which is the the latest framework 
framework program, but of course there are other sources. But I think um, because those are longer shots and typically more competitive shots, um, having signaled your interest here is, is a first important step. But I think I'd also like to hand over to Francois and Rosie because I think you provide platforms where people can get going uh, immediately where a guidance uh, and support is provided to, to local uh, initiatives. Yeah, thanks, uh, Uta. Maybe I'll jump in. Um, I just wanted to check, though, in the question you also mentioned, uh, in particular, uh, water quality and environmental education in preschool. Uh, this is a very special type of citizen. So I'm, I'm, are we really talking about uh, kindergarten or what age is, uh, were you focusing on, um, uh, Marine? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think um, um, it's too much important with my point of view. So um, education in kindergarten and uh, too much important, I mean, environmental education. And we're trying to develop this direction because I'm lecturing same time of university, but uh, I, um, when I wor I'm working with students some time, I understand that uh, we have to start with early uh, childhood because this is too much important. So now um, in from our activity, we just um, um, working on um, this, uh, focus on this direction, so environmental education and also as a water expert, I'm also interested in surface water quality, in groundwater quality. Um, and I know I, I, I so that's that's very clear and I think that's fascinating because you're right in a sense the future is in the hands of those uh, preschoolers um, and you know they'll very quickly grow up to be the the next uh, greater Thunberg uh, generation uh, if they're given the right uh, you know the right direction and, and understanding um, uh, I, I would mention a, a couple of things in this regard so so the project um, uh, you know, so in our case with crop for sdg we aim at young people, but above 16 for for some practical and data related uh, reasons. Uh, and we see a lot of amazing 16 year olds and indeed uh, even younger people doing starting their own citizen science projects. So it's in a sense almost never too early. Uh, but when we talk about uh, preschool, uh, I would uh, encourage you to look at some of the websites that gather. Um, you know, resources about citizen science for citizens. Uh, one called SciStarter uh, is, is uh, ver very much curated by a person thinking of parents who are looking for projects for their children. Um, so it's, it's one of the uh, uh, interesting uh, ways to find projects uh, that could be relevant for you. So it provides you with lots of ways to search. Um, and uh, increasingly you can find interesting projects also on the EU citizen science uh, website. So I'll, I'll put these two links uh, in the chat uh, shortly. I don't know, Rosie, if you had anything else to add. Thank you so much. So I think maybe um, uh, in um, water quality um, research and the data collection also they can be involved um, some uh, citizen science because uh, we can involve some uh, non-professionals for uh, water quality testing on for the other it, it's simple yeah i think it's um we can use this and um, regarding the education um maybe also um in this uh, cooperation uh, can be very useful yeah and i would add um uh, that, for example, there is a one application that was developed now hosted by the San Francisco, like the California Academy of Science, called SIC. I'll 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 write it in the chat. And SIC was is is a is a child of another bigger application called iNaturalist, where where you observe different things, plants, birds, insects, animals. And a whole community is helping you to uh, define exactly what it is that you observe, but also to contribute to a global database of biological observation. And SIC is using also artificial intelligence to tell you what you have observed. 
and it was designed specifically for very young children because it just point to something, take the picture and get the answer. Um, although the issue about language will be there and a few other things, but it's possible to I've lost some. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So thank you. I think um, maybe I will get some contacts uh, and we will discuss uh, the other. Um, okay. So email. Barbara? Yeah, maybe just to add a bit as Francois already mentioned the EU citizen science platform, which I also showed in my slide. And just to let you know that this is also uh, all the training and MOOCs and so on, it's all free to use. So there are some projects there on water quality monitoring, as far as I know, and there are some training resources. And there is also, you know, some, I think, for younger, uh, how to deal with younger um, citizen scientists. So in educational context of schools and so on. So just to let you know, there is no, th these are all for free to use the resources and the training and the MOOCs. Yeah, it's also worth uh, mentioning that um, there is an educational working group within, within EXA that you might like to link up with, uh, although I think it tends to be the, the older age groups rather than the kindergarten age groups, but it's worth uh, making that link. And if you go on the, the EXA website, you can see the working group and who's involved. Yeah. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, now the, the next question. It's, it came in just in time from uh, Adam. Um, so would the panelists aware of national legal framework that are regulating citizen science in different EU countries and outside? Um, anyone want to first answer this? Well, let me just, let me just chip in and, and say within the US, there, there is a legal framework for citizen science and there is a, an, an, an act of Congress um, that lays the ground rules for the federal organizations to engage in citizen science. Um, and we can provide you with the, the link for that, Adam. So that's one piece of solid legislation and I'll leave the EU on to Sven. Yeah, Sven. Thanks, thanks, Martin, um, and thanks for the question. Huh? I think it's uh, it's certainly an interesting one because indeed what we see across the globe is a lot of diversity, uh, and we do really see a few championing pieces of legislation supporting uh, citizen science. Uh, and usually we talk about two different uh, parts of the same coin. One is really legislation that is supporting citizen science for policy. So this is basically trying to uh, open up environmental uh, legislation to also account for contributions from citizen scientists. And uh, I gave a few examples before in my presentation uh, from a European perspective, but also on the other hand, we see policy for citizen science, which is really put out there to support the citizen science community. Uh, and also here we see a lot of diversity. Uh, earlier this year, we published uh, a first report on citizen science strategies in Europe. I will share the link uh, in a second, which was developed with a cost action on citizen science uh, in the past. And you really see a lot of countries thinking about specific strategies for citizen science. In Germany, for example, this is currently developed. Uh, but you also see um, uh, citizen science uh, featuring in strategies on open science, which is currently framed in the Netherlands, for example, um, where citizen science is considered a pillar and a contribution to open up science within different member states. And last but not least, uh, again, more on the support to research. We also see the European research era, which is actually pushing for also uh, not only EU wide, but also national level funding to really promote more citizen science approaches and, and citizen engagement. Uh, I stop here and I will put a few links in the chat now. Thank you, Sven. And Anna, next? Yes, just um, 
sorry, better without uh, headphones. So my two cents, just to say that in Europe, we don't have um, now as such a national or international legal framework. I mean, I can speak for a few countries that I know don't have a national legal framework. And at EU level, there is not like a legal framework, like an EU regulation, at least not for now. But for example, in the US, I just put the link, we have the US um, Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act, which has been regarded as the benchmark for like a national regulation on citizen science. And interestingly, there are countries less known like Ecuador, that for example, in its um, Amazon law, recognize the um, Monitoreo Comunitario Ambiental, which is like community monitoring as a regulated and accepted integrated practice. So I think at times we can also look at these uh, from bigger to smaller scale examples as um, good practices to regulate citizen science inclusion into uh, institutional decision making. Thank you very much. And Uta? Yes, I wanted to add what the, the colleagues have, have said and already indicated, of course, the diversity of frameworks um, that, that apply uh, not only in Europe, but around the globe. I'm afraid to say that the, the, the current situation is actually not neat and, and clean, but actually rather messy. Because as I, as I mentioned, open science is trying to be the umbrella that includes citizen science. We have this policy initiative emanating down from UNESCO. We have various national initiatives, indeed the Dutch one, but I actually the definitions are quite different so i think we, this is a space to watch you know the the, the as this moves towards uh, legal frameworks at, at member state level, we, we will see some tidying up needs to be done in terms of translating a, a global consensus, for example, on open science, how that relates to citizen science and to these bottom up initiatives in member states. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from someone in the audience? Not? Okay. So I would like to ask, yeah? I, I had a question to you because I think that it also links to the to the to the previous question in terms of frameworks. Perhaps you know you have personally been involved in the current discussions of the Aarhus Convention, updating and revision, etc. So perhaps you can reflect a little bit what that means for the citizen science community. Um, you know what are the implications really for us as the converted, let's say. So, thank you for, for the question. Um, in the past year, we have worked a uh, group from within EXA, but also with crossover to people even in the US and in other parts of the world to reconsider how citizen science can be integrated into the new recommendation on the use of electronic tools for a collection and sharing environmental information. And this is somewhat similar to the situation that we all also see within the UN Environmental Program Global Environment Outlook Report, where citizen science is grouped together with other technologies for sensing and collecting information about it. We are going through a process where the amount of information continue to grow all the time, but there are areas that uh, traditionally are not part of the whole process of even using them within national governments. So it is interesting, and that's why I always go back to the Rio conference and to Agenda 21, that in the report, the chapter that I show, chapter 40, it mentioned technologies like geographical information system, which has now became very common to use uh, within environmental information management, but remote sensing on the other end that continue to be uncomfortably sitting within the use of them in a wide sense. And in the case of both, I would say the remote sensing, the other techniques that are mentioned in the new recommendation and citizen science, I would link the, the reticence or the concern of organizations um, to issues of skills and ability to operationalize these things 
within the framework of managing environmental information and sharing it. That when you don't have the skills and when the cost of accessing remote sensing is very high, or when the whole issue of how to handle it as with citizen science is complex, uh, some organizations are preferring to continue and use try and tested methods of sharing information. So by deliberately mentioning and integrating things into the recommendation and continuously promoting them through also global environmental outlook and other things, the hope is that there will be opportunities like this one um, and through networks to have capacity building and then to engage with more and more people who can utilize these methods in each country. In the case of Aarhus, we have also the issue of the Aarhus centers, which are there for the capacity building. And there might be also an opportunity to share this information across those places. But we clearly need uh, some effort in ensuring that, that the capacity and the ability to, to integrate those new ways of, of doing information and using information um, is, is available to more and more countries. And I think that that's something important. Martin. I, if you go back to the, the last slide I, I used, I, I listed a few um, issues to take forward to UN science to UNEA 5.2 or possibly yeah. UNEA 6. And, and that is really to try to get the parties, which is the environment ministers for all the, all the representatives who come to UNEA to start to enshrine the right for citizens to gather and collect data on the environment, because that is challenged in, in a legal sense in many countries of the world when citizens are collecting data that gathers evidence on issues that people would rather not bring to light. So that was one of the reasons for wanting to see that the UN, uh, the UNEA process endorse that general principle. Um, and the previous one. Yeah, it's the it's the last one. It's the next one. Um, keep keep going. If you go to the that's the one. So what we're suggesting here is that there needs to be a global convention on citizen science to be adopted at some point in the future that builds on the Aarhus Convention, so that for instance when you when you put forward a multilateral agreement, that it becomes a natural instinct to build into that agreement, um, an obligation on the parties to integrate citizen science data into the collection of information to demonstrate compliance um, with, the, with the multilateral agreement that has been signed, but also to start looking to protect the rights of participating citizens, to address the issues of confidentiality, um, to start to build and put in place common global data and metadata systems that will allow data to migrate through the national statistical offices and independently of them up onto world database systems held by the UN. And all of these things need to be thought through and be built into the way the multilateral agreements are drafted because then it creates pressure on the member states to build that back into their national law and into their national um, approaches to delivering these obligations and it brings an honesty in some respects because if you look at the multilateral agreements um, it, it's very easy to sign up to a multilateral agreement although there's a lot of argument over the the text and, and what is actually committed to but in many cases we don't actually deliver on them within the time frames that have been agreed to and I, my belief is that by integrating citizen science into these type of agreements, we will create greater pressure to drive member states to deliver on the obligations that they've already accepted. So I think this is a great area for debate um, as we go forward in the next two to three years. Thanks, Muki. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this intervention. Um, so the next point that, that I would like to ask is, is across the panel, although we're lucky to have, I'll, I'll start actually from Anna, is that the, the, the OVS process, and, and when you look at it now, it's strongly legal process. It's now within the realm of NGOs and, and individuals having an issue. Um, 
and addressing it through the ability to ask for environmental information or to ask for justice and so on. It's the cases that maybe Anna can, can talk a little bit more about the Basilicata example. And the things that we talked were at you know, regional level, like the, the, the lowest that we talked about was European level. So how each of us can think about how the things that we talked about are relevant at the very local level. And I'll start from our legal expert, Anna. Thank you, Muki. This is a very good question. And um, I mean, unexpectedly from what we uh, assumed when um, we were on field work in Basilicata, we realized that actually people on ground uh, were very hopeful towards the European dim dimension. So they really, and also they used, for example, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. They wanted to go to, to Strasbourg. So they, they had this idea of like um, sovereign national fora, even legal sovereign national fora as the space for claiming their rights when the local instances, so for example, the, the local courts or the environmental protection agency, the Italian one, or even the regional one was not really um, taking up on their claims. I think what we should do really as citizen science scholars, legal scholars, is to open informal spaces where this uh, more uh, grassroots initiative can come and ask a legal, legal question, because many of them cannot afford uh, uh, legal counseling, like a lawyer. So maybe they rely on pro bono lawyers. And I see like, like similar to what uh, is really common in the US, the, the legal clinics where students, legal students can really advise uh, citizen scientists without economic commitment, also with less responsibility than a lawyer, but it's a first step for them to know which kind of rights or convention they can use and, and mobilize. So I think in a sense, it's, I'm still sad to feel that the, um, these types of discussions often are not that inclusive for these types of citizen scientists. But I know that many, uh, for example, often use the pollutant release and transfer register. They consult direct, directly to it. And this is really one of the main uh, symbol of the ARUS framework. So I think making these informal spaces for discussion, and really I mentioned spaces because we need kind of a, a open door, a little legal clinic where, where the citizen scientists, for example, in Basilicata can just walk into and ask informally, but also confidentially. So hopefully there will be more of that and also more lawyers that uh, find interest in this because it's also not very economically rentable to, to advise citizen scientists, no? So, and I fully uh, support what Martin was mentioning about um, rights as uh, protecting, uh, in, especially in this context where also, for example, lawyers adv advising citizen scientists could risk herself or himself of a defamation claim, for example. So it's really important to also have these frameworks legally to counterbalance other uh, rights claims, let's say. Hope I was clear. Thank you. And I would like to pass to Rosie and, and kind of talk about her, your experience, especially in the Citizen Science Center. Uh, well, I was just listening to Anna and, and what she's saying is so right. And I think that centers like the one that where I am that has been created by the University and ETH in Zurich should be the place where citizens go. I mean, I think it should really, and it's not, it is not, unfortunately, at the moment, in the sense that we are not in the position of providing this kind of legal support. We, we can provide support with the methodology, with the tools, as I said. We have done a study on ethics, uh, even though we, we kind of, um, the study generated more questions than answers, I would say. Uh, but we don't have at the moment uh, uh, any legal knowledge or any possibility to involve a legal expert. So, um, I mean, all I can say is uh, it, places like, like the center in Zurich should be the places. And I agree with, uh, with Anna that at least at national levels, there should be at least one point of reference for these kind of questions. 
Thank you. And Uta? Yes, I'd, I'd like to contribute to this discussion, um, not so much advocating necessarily for centers or, or, or some other instrumentalization of where this knowledge needs to be based, but I think it raises the discussion that what we're talking about is a whole array of stakeholders that we need when we do citizen science. So it's not just this bilateral relationship between citizens and scientists, particularly when we're talking about more bottom-up citizen science, community-driven citizen science. Those initiatives typically start with issues. These communities are facing an issue with their water quality, with their air quality, etc., and they have to maneuver a whole landscape of different policies and legal frameworks that indeed apply to them. And then, you know, we need to see that that's where facilitation comes in. That's where, you know, uh, guidance on how you can co-design is bring in the right stakeholders. So I don't think we need to national, um, necessarily institutionalize where that knowledge needs to be, but I think we would already be a step further as a community of citizen science practitioners if we realize just what a, a breadth of expertise and knowledge we really require if we want to really truly unfold the potential of citizen science. It doesn't just require some citizens and some scientists, scientists, you know, typically um, there's more at play. Thank you. And Martin? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I think from a legal point of view, you, you can envisage two, two scenarios. One is where citizens have an environmental problem that they're trying to resolve and where they build the evidence base themselves and they need all the advice and guidance that they can get when they go down that process. But something I think is, is, is much stronger is when the citizens work with the environmental regulators. Um, and what you start to do over time is you build the citizen science approach into the day job of the regulator. Um, rather than having a three or four year research project, what you're actu actually doing is engaging the citizens, working with the regulators for a common good, and in those circumstances, the legal framework within which they work is already laid out and well understood. And very often the citizens can be an indicator of a problem that then is properly researched by the official regulator. And, and a, a good example of, of, of where that was, has been tested has been in an Australia where the population densities are, are very low. And they've been experimenting with using satellite data to identify pollution incidents in water courses. And then the citizen scientists have actually gone in to ground truth the data that's coming from the satellites. And it's a, it's, it really is an inspirational technology because once you prove it works in a place like Australia, it becomes possible to use it anywhere in the world, in the remote parts of the world, in Africa or South America for the same effect. And they gave an example um, of the uh, the visual image, the visual spectrum changing in a river as a result of pollution from a wood treatment works suddenly appearing on the satellite data. Then you send a citizen scientist in to validate that information. It appears truth. Then you put the professionals in to take the legal casework forward. And it keeps the citizen away from the sharp end um, of, of that legal process, which be can, can become quite, quite difficult in some parts of the world. So those are the two the two main elements I've seen in operation. Thank you. Thank you. And Sven? Yeah, thank you. I think it's really uh, an important discussion that we're really approaching it from a bottom up and top down uh, discussion here, which is which is good. Just to complement what Anna, Uta and Martin already said, um, to a degree on, on the legal frameworks, we are getting there at international level, at European, at national level. But the question is really on capacity. So if we're looking at the European Union alone, we have like almost 450 million people. Uh, and I don't know how many tens of thousands municipalities if we talk uh, public administration. So there is a certain question of how citizen science activities, especially at, at local or even neighborhood level, could reach uh, their own uh, authorities, which are close to them. And it's even more complicated to reach those which are at higher levels and the contact points do not always exist. So there is really a bigger question where we have to consider the differences between countries, but really see how can we uh, establish structures that actually support uh, access to citizen science and to be heard uh, all across Europe, all across uh, the globe. And I think centers like Rosie mentioned are extremely important, 
but we may also consider existing infrastructures like research libraries, public libraries, and museums. But again, I stop here, but I think that's an, another important element to, to consider. Yeah. And over to Dilek. Yeah, I would like to make a few points about what Sven just discussed about the capacities and also uh, structures um, in the context of Aarhus, because this is really uh, similar to what we have been experienced with the global SDG indicator uh, framework. So like what our next uh, steps should be? What, where should we start if we really want to take this from being recommendations and start implementing them in uh, real? So um, what, what I would, as, as you, may remember in, in my presentation, I was showing one slide on a roadmap, like how we could really integrate the uh, citizen science approaches into the official SDG monitoring mechanisms. But here, maybe the question is different, but I think we still need a roadmap that identifies how are we going to be working with the, at the global level and also at the national level. Um, and um, so, in order to be able to show that we're not here just to advocate one position, our own position, uh, but we also have data, we also have science behind it that, that could actually show how this could turn into real action. Uh, and that would help these uh, convention uh, or others such as ours to basically reach their full potential and um, uh, reach their goals. Thank you. Thank you, Dilek. And I want to follow it up with a question to you, especially the example that, that you've shown about uh, Ghana, um, that the SDGs are things that look detached and, and are to some degree even unknown to specific citizens, the specific people that are living in an area and living within specific local conditions. So, what was the process that was done there to link these very large, very big goals and global goals to local activities on marine later? I think it's a very, very, very important and very good question, okay? And this was also one of the things that we have been actually discussing, as you may remember, when we were, when we gathered in Austria, Diaza, uh, when we were talking about uh, this paper that I presented also, so um, like how do we uh, engage these very local level initiatives into the global SDG indicator framework and what's in it for citizens and how this is actually affecting their daily lives. So it is, uh, and also how these local initiatives could be integrated into these global monitoring or national monitoring mechanisms. But um, so this is, this is the key to bring these global efforts into the level of uh, citizens. And actually, um, one of the things that we want to do in the short run um, is basically look into how we could integrate these into the into first the local level monitoring processes at the city level, and then take it to the national level. But what is also important is to um, integrate data probably from these because we're talking about monitoring, yeah, into coming from these different uh, initiatives into one platform that we could basically look at, uh, look at this from a broader perspective. So what we have done with the, with the um, uh, Marine Leader Project in Ghana was basically to work with the Earth Challenge because they created this data integration platform on Marine Leader and try to identify. And then we know that there was the will and the policies that are underway in Ghana. So we basically combined these already existing efforts to see uh, which uh, communities that we could work with. So what we did is look at this data integration platform and we identified the, uh, this very local groups in Ghana that are working in, the, in Accra. And then uh, which methodology they use brought us to the, um, uh, the Ocean Conservancy is one of the partners of the project as well. And then from there, basically, the, the data that was collected at the very local was feeding into a global database already that could then uh, was integrated into this global uh, uh, platform on data integration of Earth Challenge. So this was basically how, how the whole story in Ghana worked. But I think, of course, we need, to mo we need to do more and more of these efforts. And of course, there's a great role that is uh, not only for us as the citizen science community, but also the UN agencies. Uh, in this case, it was UNEP to work with these um, citizen science initiatives to help them 
uh, leverage basically their data for monitoring and also leverage their methodology to align with the methodology of the global uh, indicator methodology. Thank I think you. it was a long answer to your question, but I hope it was clear. But that's great because that's bring to a question that I would like to raise with Francois about his training and skill development program and, and the kind of how do, when you're doing all these local things, you need to think about the local culture, the local language, a lot of environmental information and knowledge is inaccessible because it's in English. And, and in many areas of say the, the, the signatory to Aarhus, um, that language is not accessible. So how the, the people who come up with the solution in the solution space are coming up with new ways of, of addressing those local issues in language that people can access? Well, that's an, an, an excellent question, uh, Muki. Um, I, I, maybe I'll take one example though, which, uh, which also refers back to the previous discussion about, you know, uh, at, at what scale um, are, are decisions being made about citizen science. So, so here in Geneva, where the local language is French, um, we, we deal with a lot of young people in French and teach them about citizen science in particular through something we have called the Scienscope, which, uh, which has um, high school students and middle school students coming in and learning about, uh, especially around biology, around uh, um, uh, genetic barcoding of insects, plants uh, from the region. And, and that project's been going on long enough that um, uh, the, the scientists involved and the organizers at the university were able to go to the cantonal authorities and actually get a uh, statement about using this approach for biodiversity monitoring uh, into uh, the code, uh, the cantonal code. So I think it's an example that you can at a local level uh, influence policies and indeed you could say politics to get citizen science onboarded and, and officialized. And all, all of that of course happens uh, in French, um, but you know, obviously we, uh, the, I think especially now with, um, with this European project, we are uh, very concerned about how to get um, more people involved locally uh, where English should not be a barrier uh, to entry. Um, I, I would say, our experience uh, in doing that has been um, that if we can get the key information about uh, the tools and, and how to use them uh, talked about in local blogs, uh, in the local language, we see a much larger interest in what we're doing. Um, so as you, you know, Muki, we've worked uh, with uh, young people in Lithuania, for example, who have um, a vibrant, uh, a hacker and maker community there, and uh, just just blogging in Lithuanian uh, brought in a, a lot more people to use uh, to contribute to certain citizen science projects. Thank you. And uh, Barbara, can you talk about how is that addressed also within the EU citizen science and other activities of of EXA? This need to consider the local language and culture and approaches. Oh uh, yes, well, actually, it's actually it's reflected in in in, in some of the working groups. I mean, the platform itself, we are putting also an effort into translating it into different languages, and it's already in quite a few languages available. I mean, the, the interface itself, some of the resources, and we have also seen that's very important. So some of our partners are very active in translating it to the different languages. And the, as I said, there's even an interface if somebody is willing to to add another language. There is also this possibility. I mean, personally, when I when I when I uh, listen to the discussion, I come from the uh, so center for social science. So we are involved in some citizen social uh, pro science projects. Also, and and in and, you know, in some of my other projects, I'm related very much into what Francois was talking about in these maker spaces. So we're now. Uh, starting actually some uh, digital innovation hubs with African maker spaces. And I see there is also a lot of potential for, uh, you know, for, for accessing uh, new communities, so to say, for citizen science. And I see it very much related also citizen science and this citizen innovation, uh, as I call it, that is often taking place in 
uh, in, in maker spaces. But with the SDGs, to be quite frank, and in my projects that I have, I still have difficulties in breaking it down what we do into these very, very specific indicators then, especially in the social sciences. Although we, you know, in some of the projects we contribute to um, uh, improved uh, health, for example, or, or aspects of that, but not at this indicator level. So it's sometimes still even for us difficult to translate it at the level of, yeah, where exactly would we contribute? Because it's at, the, at a different level, so to say, when you implement on a low scale, uh, very practical things where you would help people on the spot, but how would that still translate to these types of indicators? That, that's something, for example, I can say my work we're still struggling with. Yeah, and, and I would also add that, for example, in EU citizen science, we are very pleased to be able indeed to, to demonstrate this ability to, to include different uh, languages. So we will launch one of the training courses in Slovenian and, and we hope to be able to, you know, and all the material is free to translate uh, and deliberately created with Creative Commons. So anyone that finds material there and want to translate it to their language, they can do that. So I'll now, uh, Martin, you wanted to. Say well, it was it was just to say that when, when we set up the Citizen Science Global Partnership, the, the first documents that we produced about what we were about and what we were trying to do, we simply went out to the, the global citizen science community and asked for volunteers to help translate. And the citizen science community turned around quite complex documents with astonishing speed and with an astonishing array, uh, an astonishing array of, of, of different languages. So we looked to the strength within our own community to get past the language barrier. The, the culture barrier, I think, is about having open science, open techniques, open methods that people can take and use and then make them appropriate to their local culture and their local, their local situation and try not to dictate from the centre. Just make the tools available and empower people to take them forward. The last thing I think that's, that's really important is, is that when you find citizen science projects that, that I say hit the sweet spot, which, which really tackle a critical environmental issue or a critical health issue that affects people's daily lives and has a feedback loop to them that gives them information that's credible and useful to affect how they manage risk in their own lives. You get astonishing numbers of people wanting to take part. And once you get to that point, the, the desire for change becomes impelling in that community. It's impossible to ignore what, what that data is then providing. And I, just a simple example would be the, 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 the air quality monitoring in Belgium, in Antwerp and, and in the Netherlands, where just the sheer number of people that took part drove political change. Uh, it was impossible to ignore. And that's why I think that when you start looking at scaling up citizen science, it becomes such a powerful movement for change. And, and that's where we have to, I think, go as a, as a movement uh, in the next five to 10 years. Because quite frankly, on some of these bigger issues, that's that five to 10 years is now critical. Thank you, Dilek. I just wanted to go back to this language issue that you and Barbara were talking about, and also what Barbara said about the SDGs and indicators level. Um, so first of all, this, I think in terms of addressing this language barrier, EXA has a very key role here. And um, because uh, it has communities from different countries that they could work with as the example that Barbara highlighted and you mentioned, uh, but also we had a particular uh, issue within the EU citizen science project because as part of the project, we came up with quality framework for citizen science resources. And we wanted to showcase good quality resources for citizen science for the community. We wanted to share that with the community. But of course we were receiving overwhelming, uh, very good quality resources that we were going through our framework for. But then, uh, there is the issue of uh, us being able to only uh, address this in certain languages. So we can do this in English, maybe um, colleagues speaking other languages uh, going through this quality framework is doing this, but what about the other languages? Because there's really rich information that are produced in many different countries and many different languages on citizen science. So it's really important. And Barbara is just like, uh, there's no time probably to discuss this here, but um, we can talk about uh, these SDGs and indicators uh, issue that you're struggling with offline. 
Okay, thank you. And Francois? Uh, yeah, it was it was uh, about the, the same issue that um, Dilek just mentioned and Barbara brought up about the indicators. Uh, what, I, what I would say, so also from uh, the work that our colleagues at UNITAR have been doing with national statistical offices, is uh, the realization that the, the NSOs really are interested in a much broader range of data. First of all, there are national level indicators that are, can be quite different from those that are that the, the UN has, has published with the SDGs. Uh, plus there's um, there's associated data that, that, that they want to gather that you know uh, can be uh, whatever is available from a certain project may be of interest. Uh, the question is, and I think you brought it up at the beginning, uh, Muki, uh, that the NSOs want some kind of validation that the data is, is reliable. So their standards do matter at a certain level. Um, but it's not as though grassroots um, citizen science should be trying to solve the SDGs. They should be trying to solve their problem. And in a sense, the, they will generate data that, that and usually that NSOs um, uh, want to use. So, uh, you know, maybe putting it in a bigger sp perspective, citizen science itself is often a one step in a larger process of social change. Uh, and I think it's important to you know, to realize that the, the data that a community needs, um, you know, may not align exactly with the SDGs. Thank you. And Sven? Yes, I would like to take it exactly from there, um, because indeed uh, we could speak about the, the phrase of uh, thinking global, act local, right? and it, it's really about, about that in a sense, because also being involved in a lot of monitoring in the past myself, uh, the institutionalization of citizen science to environmental monitoring or to monitoring the SDGs is not the, the main goal, right? I mean, this is some interest to collect these data and to share them for monitoring of the SDGs, for example. But at the same time, it's equally important and their skills have also to be developed to actually listen to the needs of, of people at the local uh, dimension and also to... Uh, to help them and empower them with the data collected, maybe with other mechanisms, to actually make a transition to sustainable development. So instead of measuring progress towards the goals, change of lifestyle is actually another very strong uh, argument for using citizen science approaches. Um, and also there we need some opening up sometimes of public institutions to be aware that this is not just a, a false, cheap way of data collection, but it's really making a step towards the public and help solving local problems. Thank you very much. And I think we now come to the end. 